Welcome to our class lecture tonight. Team, I wanted to um, welcome you to our first attempt at trying to uh, flip the classroom. So flipping the classroom involves doing a lecture outside of the classroom and then discussing the material inside the classroom. Um, the other experiment that we're doing this week is discussing virtually. So I will create a discussion board on Blackboard where you will post your discussion notes for this lecture. Your notes should have three things in them. Um, number one, you should identify something in the lecture that you really grasped and something that you would be able to teach to someone else. Number two, um, something that you didn't grasp well and that you have a question about. And then number three, um, your suggestion for how to improve the course and the delivery of the course. So uh, with those three things, uh, post those three things to the discussion board. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory. If anybody has any questions, you can text me and let me know that you're having difficulty and I'll try to walk you through it. So on to the lecture. Tonight we're going to talk about the operational excellence system as a way to conduct operations management. Remember that we said uh, in the beginning of the course that operations management um, t combines resources and process in order to get things done. And so operations management is the management of resources and process to get things done. Um, the resources that are involved in operations are typically human resources, people, and materials in a process or a service. Um, so it might be intellectual material that's being used in a process. Whatever the case is, most companies want to get better. They want to grow, they want to improve their profitability, and so we entitle that achieving world class. That's the ultimate aim for why do we want to implement something called operational excellence as our operations management platform. Just a quick review, uh, if you look back over the history of operations management as we have, you will recall that the, t the scale, the human and operational scale, has been tipped back and forth over the years, starting with the Industrial Rep Revolution, which tipped it uh, in the operational direction through the introduction of mass production. Um, then on to scientific management that tipped it even further in the direction of operations, and um, that was done through the implementation of standardization. Later, in response to that tipping of the scale, there was the human relations movement that tended to tip the scale back in the other direction. And uh, unchecked, it would continue to check the, to tip the scale in the other direction. Um, but then we noticed that this uh, guy named Deming showed up on the scene and began to give us a more balanced approach. If you remember his 14 points, about half of them had to do with operations and the other half had to do with the human system. Um, somewhere in the middle there was some blend that um, balanced both the human and the operational and was centered at making improvement. So it's with Deming as a background, with Toyota as they looked at stu and studied Deming and ha began to implement the Toyota production system as a background that we find ourselves today talking about this thing called operational excellence. I will show you a specific system for operational excellence that I teach and coach. And so we will take a look at how that is expressed and also take a look at, um, in our future discussions, uh, some detailed tools and some components of that system. And we'll also talk about how it contrasts and compares with uh, your research on the Toyota production system that you're uh, turning in tonight during class, tonight being the Thursday night uh, of this week. So, why operational excellence achieving world class? The three things I want to do in this presentation are to create a case for, op for systematic improvement. What do I mean by systematic? Well, essentially what I'm looking at there is improvement that's done in a way that's predictable. Systems are predictable. Components work together to give us a result. The cardiovascular system, as we said in week one, all the components of the system work to oxygenate our blood and to get rid of the waste that, it, that is in our blood. 
So systems work together to give us a predictable result and improvement systems need to do that as well. So we'll talk about uh, systematic improvement and why operational excellence fits that model very well. We'll define world class. So if we're aiming at this thing called world class, we really need to define what that looks like. And then we'll dip into defining operational excellence as a system. So first, this case for systematic improvement. All organizations need these things. Number one, they need alignment. They need to be able to have alignment from leadership the whole way out to the frontline worker. What do we mean by alignment? We're talking about goals and targets that are synchronized. We're talking about attitudes and mindsets that are synchronized, uh, the whole way down to values. Uh, we've talked a little bit about organizational values and the concept of resonance, so I won't belabor that point, but values that resonate are are aligned values and they actually create more alignment as you go up the cultural triangle. Uh, resonant values cause alignment in mindset which causes alignment in behaviors. We need continuous improvement. In order to get better, by the nature of getting better, we need to continuously improve. It's almost oxymoronic whenever you think about it. The idea of improvement is that we um, make things better. Uh, it is not time bound, so it's not make things better and stop. But by adding the term continuous to continuous improvement, um, the implication is that this goes on forever and ever. Um, and kind of asymptotically, so it, it, we are always trying to approach perfection, zero defects. But we know that we'll never quite get there, but we continue to aim there. The third thing on the list is developing great people, teams, processes, culture, returns to your investors, and just a brief word, kind of a parking lot item here on investors. Investors may be your customers. Investors may be financiers, maybe banks, maybe venture capitalists. Um, it may be you as a stockholder in your own company. So investing, investors are a very broad term there and development of a stronger community. We've talked in the past about how uh, Toyota faced outward towards the community, recognizing the community as a significant source for, its, for the raw material of its human resources. And so having a strong community makes sense for a company. Um, and then finally, ultimately, we want to increase our profits. And we do that by decreasing our expenses because we work in a competitive field. Most of the time, we can't change our price all that much. We can't pass our cost increases on to our customers. We have to keep the price the same, which means that we're always constantly under threat of making less profit. And so it's important for us to increase profits. And the way that we would do that in an operational excellence system is by decreasing expenses or costs. We need a definition for world class. So we've said this is why we need to do this, but this is the where we're heading. We're heading to world class. And uh, there are many, many aspects about world class that we can talk about. But I'm going to just talk about these four uh, to begin with here tonight. The first one, safety, problem solving, target attainment, control, and then teamwork. We'll look at each one of those in turn. So first of all, what is world class and safety? Well, number one, we want an extremely low accident rate. And that should be done by exemplary attitude of the employees and with fixed and lived safety standards. So let me talk about the first one, exemplary attitude. What am I talking about there? I'm not talking about behavior. I'm talking about mindset. So our extremely low accident rate is a byproduct of the mindset that I want to stay safe. I want to keep my environment safe for my teammates and for my coworkers and for my customers and for the community. And the second piece of it is fixed and live standards. And that is up in the behavior section of the cultural triangle. So we have agreed upon safety standards and we adhere to those safety standards primarily because we've got the right attitude. In a safety culture where we have exemplary attitude, accidents and near misses are reported and really analyzed systematically. Well, what does analyze systematically mean? We mean try to find the root cause for each and every problem that occurs. 
Accident statistics are communicated regularly, so there's, there's no hidden information about statistics. It's very transparent. Safety inspections are carried out by employee teams. And this is a little bit different. In some companies that I've worked with and that I've worked in, there's been a specialized group of people, safety specialists, who do the safety inspections because they're trained in things like OSHA rules and regulations, occupational safety and health administration rules and regulations. But in a world-class culture, because again of the exemplary attitude, the mindset, we're able to cause employees to actually do inspections that result in near misses or um, unsafe conditions, hazard recognized, and we're able to analyze those things systematically. Legal requests are exceeded in a world-class culture. What we mean here is that we have the letter of the law, and in a, in a great world-class company uh, with regard to safety, we exceed the letter of the law. And finally, we use low-cost automation to remove safety risks. This is a big uh, misunderstanding when people take a look at, for example, robots on the Toyota line. Um, and they're saying, well, they want to cut their label costs. Well, the primary reason to use technology at Toyota is to remove safety risks, not to remove people. Because if you remove people, then you waste that human creativity and they would never do that. Moving on to problem solving. So problems are grasped and solved at the root cause. We know that. Uh, proactive measures prevent problem reappearance. So we're actually moving from reaction to proaction in terms of problem solving. All employees participate in systematic problem solving. And the word systematic, again, should, in, should imply to you that this is predictable and continuous and um, that there are some moving parts that, that we have to have in order to do problem solving. Next bullet, problems are immediately analyzed and necessary measures are taken. This doesn't mean that every problem is solved to its root cause, but it's analyzed to determine whether or not it's a problem that we need to pick up or is this a problem that we just need to contain. So. Um, and if we need to solve it, then necessary measures are taken, either to contain and create countermeasures or to just contain the problem. And then finally, uh, under world-class problem solving, we, we start to crank up quality targets. And the distinctive thing is that those quality targets are agreed upon by everybody in the organization. And the development of those, uh, those targets are commonly done, in other words, they're done by teams of people that are representative of the entire organization. And key, key, key here is this last piece, that they are visualized. So we want to make sure that we are visualizing our targets. That's world-class problem solving. World-class target attainment and control. Uh, again, tar common targets, valid for everyone, and fixed together, meaning that, that we've knitted them together. All targets are quantified and completely adapted to the changing environment. The whole company agrees on targets at least once or twice a year and orients the measured master plans accordingly. They, we want to make sure that our focused improvement activities are aiming clearly at the improvement portion that we're seeing between what our current state performance is and what the target actually is. We want to make sure that our core strategies and measures and targets and plans are all written down and visualized. So we'll learn later that the core strategies, measures, and targets are all a function of this thing that we call the balance scorecard or the BSC. Um, plans are written down and visualized and we'll see later that one component of the system is called master plans. We want to make sure that all employees have an extensive outlook on the status and um, they can change how they contribute to efficiency. And we want to make sure that necessary data is no longer thrown away without a doubt. We know that we produce a lot of data about targets and attainment. We want to make sure that we keep the right stuff and get rid of the stuff that isn't really helping us. Finally, on world class, a lot of people talk about teamwork, but this is specifically what we, we mean here. 
So we, we mean mutual trust and respect among team members. Team members that take responsibility for quality, production, efficiency, and administration of their own team. This isn't to be confused with self-led teams because in an operational excellence system, um, there clearly is a team leader and that team leader is a member of a team. So he or she has a team leader as well and you can just continue to go the whole way up the line. Um, but we are talking about some autonomy for the teams so that they are responsible responsible for quality and production performance and efficiency. Um, teamwork in a world-class company does involve cross-team networking and cooperation so uh, other names or phrases that we'd hear would be cross-functional or cross-disciplinary problem solving. Um, there should be regular development and judgment conversations. Development meaning are we where we need to be and are we able to do what we need to do and then judgment um, looking back PDCA plan to check act how did we do and we need to be continually holding that up against what the customer wants what the customers requests are um, we want to build training concepts and plans that last more than three years it's very typical in companies that are not world-class to have the flavor of the month and a lot of uh, spend of resources on uh, whatever is vogue or whatever the the top leader um, becomes enamored with. Um, but in a world-class company, training concepts are, are institutionalized and they generally cover about a three to five year period. A um, couple of other bullets here, I'll skip over a couple of them. Um, indirect employees can pitch in, so uh, we've got enough cross-functionality and flexibility that, um, that they can fulfill every job in production. And what that means is not every person doing every job, but every person being able to do one job on either side of them, if you think about the jobs being in a, in a production line setting. So uh, a couple thinking models here. Now we haven't talked about these, I haven't drawn these on the board yet. We'll talk about these extensively in the next few weeks. But the first one is the operational excellence team model or the five circles model. And you'll see that um, essentially what we're talking about here is me and my team in the middle and the team above, the team below, and the team from side to side. And there's overlap across all of those boundaries. Um, we will be paying attention to the overlap portion here. And so we'll talk about things like daily meetings and monthly meetings and targets on balanced scorecards. And we're going to try and put some context in, in meaning here about what happens across these uh, these overlaps. There isn't a day go by in, that goes by in my coaching uh, vernacular that I don't scribble these five circles on a piece of paper for someone, or on a whiteboard, or on a flip chart for someone um, to describe uh, how problems move and flow, and uh, how decisions are made, and how we're interlocked as a as a team of teams. So this is a really important diagram. Don't expect you to grasp it fully in this course, but definitely something you want to uh, understand more carefully. Um, I'm also going to redraw this on the board um, whenever we reconvene uh, virtually next week. Um, but this is a leadership model, also called the leadership triangle. And the idea here is for the leader to continually try to recenter him or herself. Sometimes he, has to, he or she has to be at the top of the classic organizational triangle um, at that point is, is leaning more towards operational system things. Sometimes the leader spends some time down here at the bottom of the triangle supporting. That becomes a, a much more human-centered en endeavor here. And the idea is to try to return to the center to create that human and operations balance. More on that later as I show you um, how coaching cycles work in the system. But uh, for right now, we're just going to leave it at that, keep that model in front of you, and the idea of this model is to return to the center. All right, so uh, we, we talked about what is world class, we talked about the case for systematic improvement, um, and we talked uh, about these two thinking models that we'll bring to bear on uh, the rest of the system as we go through it. The two thinking models are the five circles and the leadership triangle. Um, now let's take a look at, at what is operational excellence in general. I'm not going to go into the detailed components of the system right now, but what I will do is, is go broad brush over some general concepts here. 
So first of all, uh, operational excellence is defined as these things. First, a, co a contemporary cultural adaptation of the Toyota production system. Um, myself, my staff, my colleagues, my mentors have all been working over the past 10 to 20 years at creating a contemporary cultural adaptation of the Toyota production system. Let me speak to each one of those words. Contemporary meaning that it fits the time right now, but it's always changing adaptation. So we really want to pay attention to the fact that the world-class system that we use, operational excellence, is one that has to be fit to the current time. Why is that true? How do I know that that's true? Well, if you take a look at all the history work that we've done over the past several weeks, you can see that, that um, the, the management systems that were developed by management thinkers in operations management fit the need at the time. During the rapid expansion of the needs for consumer goods during the Industrial Revolution, it's no, it, it makes perfectly good sense that the scale gets tipped on the operational side through some of the things that we began to see during the Industrial Revolution, the beginnings of standardization. Not full standardization, but the beginnings of it. And then you move to scientific management. We've been through two world wars at that point. And so the need to be able to produce products of high quality, um, turning up the standards uh, meter a little bit further, and, but at, at a high level of productivity as well, is, is really important. The other reason that we needed to standardize work processes at that point in time was because we were changing workforces during those wars. Men went off the war and women went, went into the factories to produce goods and services for war. So yeah, it's got to be a contemporary adaptation. Second piece of this is a cultural adaptation of the Toyota production system. Because the Toyota production system as, as it was learned and developed in, in Tokyo City is slightly different than the one that you might see in Georgetown, Kentucky. They know that you need to do cultural adaptation, so we know that you have to do it. You need to be thinking about the difference between Eastern thinking and Western thinking to, to try to make sure that you've got the right context and the right framework, the right um, paradigm. But uh, at the same time, you need to be also thinking about how can I adapt that to fit the culture that I'm in. A good case in point might be the difference in cultures between manufacturing and healthcare. Where in manufacturing, it's perfectly acceptable to say that problems are blessings, but in healthcare and hospital settings, a problem could kill someone. And so problems are not necessarily quote unquote blessings. Second bullet here, main focus of an operational ex excellent system is the human and operations balance through continuous improvement. I have a model here, a thinking model that we'll look at that'll make this a little bit more clear. Um, it is a systematic approach to continuous improvement by focusing on waste elimination. So two key, phrase, key words here, systematic, again it goes back to do we have components pulled together to consistently produce something called continuous improvement and what does that? It is by focusing on waste elimination, it's focusing on are the things that are getting in the way on the operational side of just-in-time production and the things that are getting away on the human side of mutual trust and respect. And so we, we don't really talk about that in, in this continuous improvement bullet, but we spell it out right here, mutual trust and respect. Well, how do we know uh, what's waste and, and, and what these barriers are in mutual trust and respect? We've got to put our customer first. We have to be able to understand what does the customer want. They define and describe, they customize, the customer customizes the need, and that's what we're trying to respond to. Uh, final bullet here is that it's a journey, and, and that the operational system is always improving itself by implementation. So as we implement different components of the system, we go through learning cycles and we harvest that learning from our implementation so that we can get better at implementing it the next time. So this is the, uh, the thinking model that I was talking about. You'll find this on my website. You can see it is branded the Atom Strategy here. Um, on the top here you have the human system, um, the arrow pointing and aiming at growth. Uh, growth would be whatever the organization defines it as. Um, and then the operational system pointing at the exact same thing. Um, we know that the human system is represented by people, 
and that the operational system is represented by process. And we know that when people and process come together, we have problems and we need some sort of problem solving methodology. And so the thing in the middle here, the, the thing that is pushing into the middle and uh, that is actually grabbing these arrows and forcing them together because they don't want to naturally converge. Um, but the only way to get good sustainable growth is to is to get that um, to, is to get those those two arrows to converge. So these things, continuous improvement, are actually causing the arrows to converge. And you can see that that the nugget, the engine in the middle of that, is problem solving. These problem solving cycles lead to micro innovations and sometimes lead to macro innovations. Um, and those innovations actually lead to good sustainable growth. You can also see down here in the operational system that we're talking about the elimination of waste, um, which is being tensioned by our need to produce just in time, exactly what the customer wants, exactly when they want it, defect free. Um, these are all the things that we talk about when we talk about what are we aiming at. Um, and ultimately this will increase profitability. So uh, the idea of the diagram here is that if we push forward with a strategy of implementing a continuous improvement system that balances the human and the operational, then the human system is pushed inward and the operational system is pushed inward and they begin to converge. And again, that convergence gives us the strength of growth. So let's look at the values. If you remember the operational, ex I'm sorry, the uh, cultural triangle here. So we've got uh, values down here at the bottom. We've got mindsets here in the middle. I can draw an S, I sure can. And actions up here at the top. So when we're talking about values, we're talking about in an operational excellence culture, it's the stuff that lives down here at the bottom of the triangle. Um, number one, we want to create mutual trust and respect. And number two, we want to focus on our customers' needs first. Again, they're the customer, and that that when we focus on them, we respect them. We we understand what they are in our value chain. Um, we want to ensure teamwork. That forces us to respect one another as our team. And we also want to take pride in our company. That shows that we're respecting the company. You can see that these are outcomes, and that these are the inputs. Right here, mutual trust and respect is the input, and the outputs are customer needs first, ensuring teamwork, and taking pride in our company. Our operational values are safety, quality, productivity, human development, costs, and operations, operational excellence in that order. So this is the key phrase that makes it behave like a value. I can deliberately choose to focus on safety over cost. What does that look like in an operational excellence? management system. It means that when we have a daily meeting, we talk about safety problems, then quality problems, then productivity problems, then human development problems, then cost problems. If we only have so many resources that we can burn on solving a problem in that day, um, and, and we have uh, a safety problem and three cost problems, then we would pick the safety problem because that is our operational value. Safety, then quality, productivity, human development, cost, and operational excellence in that order. That's what makes them behave as values. And then lastly, we have that continuous improvement line in the middle there. So, so we need to put some value statement against that as well. And what, what did we say? If you look back at the model, it says that it's balancing the human and the operational through problem solving. So that is the value that we're aiming for. We want to, we want to value things. We place a value on things that balance us. Um, they don't tip in the operational direction or tip in the human direction too far. Um, they're balancing. And we do that by ensuring that we consistently solve problems. We hear something that we didn't expect or something that, that should have happened that didn't happen, and we attack it with problem solving. That is our primary weapon. Some uh, sidebar notes here. We only have a few more slides here on the operational excellence system. Um, number one, the, the OE system is fully adaptable to any industry and any function within that industry. And, and the key is this. Let me go back real quickly. The key is this right here. Every industry has people and process coming together where problems occur. 
So every industry would benefit from problem solving. Every in industry would benefit from continuous improvement that uses problem solving that leads to innovation that leads to growth. So it doesn't matter what industry you're in, it doesn't matter what function you have in that industry, the OE system is completely and fully adaptable to that. Um, and let me just jump down to the bottom here. You can see that um, we have successfully implemented OE systems in manufacturing, service, hospitals, physician practices, and groups. And within the service industry, we're talking um, they provide, you know, providing consulting services, we're talking about providing financial services, we're talking about the um, back office functions of many businesses. So whatever it is, it's completely adaptable to those things. Um, and some other fine points here, it's been uh, implemented organization-wide. So we, we've done organizational in implementations just with top-level leaders, just on the production floor, just in a pilot hall. Typically we do all those things plus um, implementation in a value stream. So ultimately as we move from phase one, we're only going to look at phase one in this course of a three-phase implementation. But as we complete phase one and move into the second phase, implementing focused improvement, the idea of value stream. How do we, how do we connect functions and process together to deliver value to the customer um, becomes very critical, very important. So we will be looking at the detailed components, the, the, operational, the operations management components of operational excellence in uh, the f upcoming weeks. But I just want to give you a sneak peek at what some of those, those components are. So uh, we break each phase. You can see this is the fa phase one, the cultural change phase. And we break it into two levels, level A and level B. There's really no timing necessarily involved, although it is a timed process. Um, some of our clients have taken 12 months to get from here to here. Some have taken 24 months. To get some have taken three months to get from here to here depends on the size of the organization and the uh, the zealousness of the top leader essentially um, so in the level a system we have what we've just gone through uh, why operational excellence so we need to begin our change management with why are we doing this and what's the vision um, but we also do uh, implement some degree of change management process so that people don't get get lost we implement the concept of a steering committee. So this is a group of senior leaders, a subset of senior leaders that are responsible for implementation of the system. We implement the balanced scorecard, which is a visual representation of the annualized targets. It also stands for a six-year plan uh, for those targets. We'll much more on that later. We implement an annual planning cycle where we look at these balanced scorecards and we ask ourselves the question, what's our improvement portion for the next year and how do we intend to use focused improvements to get that improvement portion. We talk about a communication plan. So once we have some idea of change management and what we want to do, then we want to be able to communicate that on a regular and cyclical basis. We implement a suggestion system, which is aimed at unlocking creativity. And as we push down on the operational side of the scale with the, the management system, um, we want to push, we want to rebalance the scale on the human side by creating uh, something that's fun and engaging. So the suggestion system here that I'm talking about is not the box on the wall where you slip in your good idea. Um, and then if it's an idea that leads to a lot of savings, you get paid a lot of money. Um, now, this is incremental improvement done by the individual. In fact, the, the uh, tagline we use is, I implement incremental improvement, the four I's. And uh, you get a small reward and some recognition for every improvement or suggestion that, that is approved um, and goes in. And most of them are approved because they're, they're tiny. We implement a safety system, and sometimes we do that in conjunction with workplace organization or 5S, and they, those two together are sometimes called 6S. So we'll take a look at what those look like and why we use them. Um, we implement Problem Solving 1. This is individual problem solving where we teach um, basic five whys, how to get to the root cause, 
how to uh, plan and implement countermeasures, and how to check and control to make sure that your countermeasures removed your root cause. You can see down here, at, but beneath this line, these are uh, things that we actually call um, foundational. Just a second here. Foundational. So visual management, um, one of the, the key elements in lean thinking, um, also a key foundational piece in Toyota and, and in operational excellence. Can we see that a problem is occurring? And uh, if we see a problem is occurring, um, who's responsible? So roles and responsibilities for what? Um, and then who's responsible for safety and quality and productivity? Then finally, the plan to check act cycle. And that's pretty self-explanatory uh, based on your work and research that you've done through uh, Schuhart and Deming. Level B of phase one, there's an organizational strategy. So as we begin to uh, realize we need to be more customer facing, that causes us to be thinking about how we deliver value and therefore we, we need to organize in order to be able to deliver value. Um, we introduced the idea of teamwork and I'm not talking about the uh, Kumbaya by the campfire, I'm talking about um, how do we actually organize ourselves on teams so that we're able to solve problems and create value. We create a pilot hall um, where this entire system goes into place in an existing production environment and then that pilot hall becomes the place that we harvest learning to do that thing that we called adaptation, so cultural and contemporary adaptation through learning through the pilot hall. And then we implement some classic lean tools here, and these two are forcing us to get to this issue of just in time. Much more on that later from an operations philosophy standpoint, but for right now, understand that Kanban 1, simple material flow Kanbans, replicates a pull system, and pull is what gets us to just in time. And then and on 1, the classic call for help, um, creates a standard sequence for a call for help, also related to how we produce things just in time. And then at the bottom, the foundational piece of, of Level B is something called the management cycle. Again, we're not going to cover that in this course, but these are the management competencies and leadership competencies that are required to operate an operational excellence system. Okay, I know I've covered a lot of ground here tonight. I've lost track of exactly how long I've been going, but um, if you have any questions, post them to the discussion board. The three bullets that I want on your discussion notes that you'll post on the board are, uh, number one, give me something that you grasped in this lecture and that you would be able to teach to someone else. Number two, um, give me something that you didn't grasp real well in the lecture and tell me what your question is about it. And then number three, Tell me how we could improve this kind of delivery of, of the lecture. So with that as my ending, have a great night, and I look forward to seeing your discussion posts. Um, don't forget to turn in your papers on Thursday, and I will try to have those graded, return them to you, along with the first paper, which I graded eons ago, um, to you uh, the week after this. So have a great night.